Hi Adams, this is Miss Kay and we are on Unit 7 Lesson 2 today and we're going to talk a little bit more about the boycotts and protests that were going on in the colonies. <clears throat> so here's your vocab. The first one is liberty, which is a noun and that means freedom. Repeal is a verb and that means to undo a law. Eliminate is a verb and that means to get rid of something. Indirectly is an adverb, and that means not having a clear connection. So if you are friends with somebody indirectly, you're not super close friends, you don't have a clear connection, but you're still friends. Boycott is a verb, and that means to protest something by refusing to buy, use, or participate. A musket is a noun, and that is a long, heavy gun that is loaded at the muzzle. Number seven is engraving, which is a noun, and that is a design or lettering made by cutting into the surface of material. So if you engrave something, you're drawing or writing something by cutting into it. Accurate is an adjective, which means without mistakes, having the right facts. And our last word is a patriot, which is a noun, and that is a person who supports and defends their country. So chapter two is called Trouble is Brewing, and our big question we're going to think about is who were the Sons of Liberty, and what form of protest did they lead in the Boston Harbor? Some of the most passionate protests against the Stamp Act took place in Boston, Massachusetts. There, angry crowds took their frustration out on tax collectors. A new group of protesters formed in Boston in response to the Stamp Act. The group met under a tree they call the Liberty Tree. They made public speeches against taxes and the British government. They cried, no taxation without representation. This group became known as the Sons of Liberty. Eventually, after much protest, the British government decided to repeal the Stamp Act in 1766. Parliament eliminated the tax on paper products, but in 1767 it replaced it with other taxes, including taxes on imported goods such as tea. These taxes were officially called the Townsend Acts. All right, so here is um, tea. This is what it looked like uh, back in the 1700s. And it said buying, selling, even drinking tea became a political act in 1773. Because if you were buying the tea and drinking the tea, you were basically saying that you were supporting the British government and their taxes. This is a teapot celebrating the repeal of the Stamp Act. Tea was a popular drink in the colonies, just as it was in Great Britain. However, many people decided they would not buy British tea if they had to pay an unfair tax. And they thought the new tax on tea was every bit as unfair as the old tax on paper. After all, the new tax had been approved by the same British Parliament in London, and there were still no representatives from the 13 colonies there. Suddenly, deciding to take a sip of tea meant something more than just having a drink. If you bought British tea, you were paying a tax, and indirectly, you were agreeing that Parliament had the right to tax the colonies. On the other hand, if you refused to buy British tea, you were making a statement of a different kind. You were saying that you did not approve of and would not accept taxation without representation. Colonists who were angry about the new tax agreed not to buy British tea, but they didn't stop there. They also visited inns and other places that sold tea and asked the owners to stop selling it. Many establishments agreed to boycott British tea. This is an advertisement for a Sons of Liberty meeting. Debates and protests about the British government's role in colonial affairs continued, especially in Boston. In 1768, in response to the protests about the new taxes, the British government sent soldiers to Boston to keep an eye on the Sons of Liberty. Because the British soldiers wore red uniforms, the colonists sometimes referred to them as redcoats or lobsterbacks. In March 1770, several Bostonians got into a tussle with a redcoat. The Bostonians surrounded the soldier and called him names. They threw snowballs at him, and some of the members of the crowd even threatened him with sticks and clubs. 
More British soldiers arrived on the scene. They ordered the Bostonians to go home, but the angry protesters refused. The situation became more serious when even more people poured into the streets. Soon, a crowd of 300 angry Bostonians was pressing in on the outnumbered British soldiers. Some of the Bostonians shouted at the soldiers, daring them to fire their guns. One of the Bostonians threw something at the soldiers. It may have been a snowball, it may have been a rock, whatever it was, it hit one of the soldiers and knocked him down. Perhaps thinking his life was in danger, the soldier fired his musket. One of the Bostonians fought back, attacking the soldier with a club. After that, the other British soldiers responded. They fired into the crowd. When it was over, five people were dead. The Sons of Liberty were outraged. They began making speeches about the incident, which became known as the Boston Massacre. They insisted that the Bostonians had been pro protesting peacefully, and the British had no reason to fire on them. One of the Sons of Liberty, a man named Paul Revere, created an engraving that showed British soldiers firing into a crowd of peaceful protesters. It was not an entirely accurate picture of what had happened, but many colonists thought it was. And this is the engraving that Paul Revere had made showing what happened at the Boston Massacre. What it's not showing is how the people from Boston were throwing things and attacking the soldiers as well. The world's largest tea party. In December 1773, there was another incident in Boston. Three ships loaded with tea were docked in Boston Harbor. The captains had orders to unload the tea so it could be sold in Boston. The Sons of Liberty refused to let this happen. They had spent a lot of time convincing people of Boston not to buy or sell British tea. There was no way they were going to let the captains unload all that tea. The Sons of Liberty demanded the captains raise anchor and sail away. The captains weren't sure what to do, so they didn't do anything. The ship sat in the harbor until the Sons of Liberty finally decided to get rid of the tea once and for all. Dressed as Native Americans, they and other members of the Patriot Movement boarded the ship and threw the tea into the Boston Harbor. They dumped approximately 340 chests of tea worth hundreds of thousands of dollars in today's money into the Atlantic Ocean. Later, this act of protest came to be known as the Boston Tea Party. And here is the Boston Tea Party. You can see they're getting onto the ship. They are disguised as Native Americans and they are dumping the tea into the harbor. Phyllis Wheatley. When the Stamp Act was repealed, many people in the colonies were delighted. Some wrote letters, articles, and songs expressing their gratitude. One woman named Phyllis Wheatley wrote a poem. Phyllis Wheatley was an enslaved African who had been brought to Massachusetts on a slave ship. She had gone to work in the home of a merchant named John Wheatley. The Wheatleys taught her to read and write. Eventually, she began to write poetry. A book of her poems was published in 1773. Her poem to King George became one of her best known works. To the King's Most Excellent Majesty, 1768. Your subjects hope, dread sire, the crown upon your brows may flourish long, and that your arm may in your God be strong. O oh, may your sceptre numerous nations sway, and all with love and readiness obey. But how shall we, the British King, reward? Rule thou in peace, our Father and our Lord. Midst the remembrance of thy favors past, the meanest pheasants most admire the last. I'm sorry, the meanest peasants most admire the last. May George, beloved of all the nations round, life with heaven's choicest, constant blessings crowned. Great God direct and guard him from high on, and from his head let, let every evil fly. And may each climb with equal gladness, see a monarch smile can set his subjects free. So basically, she wrote this poem. Um, she's saying, the crown upon your brows may flourish. That means um, do well. You're going to be a great king. She hopes him well. She hopes that his subjects obey him. So this was one of the poems that was created after the Stamp Act was repealed. Crispus Attucks. 
Crispus Attucks was among the people killed during the Boston Massacre. Attucks was part African and part Native American. He had been enslaved, but at the time of the Boston Massacre, he was a sailor. During the crossfire, Attucks was shot in the chest and died immediately. Three others, and eventually a fourth, also died as a result of the incident in Boston. On the day of their funerals, many shops closed. Thousands of people filed through the streets of Boston following the victims' coffins. Attucks and the others became heroes. The Sons of Liberty The Sons of Liberty was largely made up of small business owners. Several were merchants and tradesmen. The group got its name from an Irishman named Isaac Barr. Barr was a soldier and a politician. He spoke out in the British Parliament against some of the decisions being made regarding colonies. Like George Washington, Isaac Barr fought in the French and Indian War. He was involved in the defeat of the French at the Battle of Quebec. He was strongly opposed to the taxes that were being imposed on the colonists. In one of his speeches, Barr referred to the colonists as Sons of Liberty. The name inspired some of the protesters in the colonies, and the group has been known as the Sons of Liberty ever since. All right, your questions. Be sure to go back in the text, find the part they're talking about, and locate your answer. So first we're going to talk about that quote, no taxation without representation. The Sons of Liberty say this when they're protesting. What does this phrase mean? Number two, why were the colonists boycotting tea? What was going on? Number three is an opinion question. Do you think the British soldiers had good reason to fire on the Boston people? For number four, I want you to give me evidence to support this. So if you said yes, give me evidence that says that they did have a right to, to fire on them. They were in danger. Or if you said no, then give me evidence that says that those Bostonians were innocent and they should not have been shot at. Number five, the incident in Boston Harbor when colonists dumped tea became known as the blink. What was that called? Number six, who was Phyllis Wheatley? Number seven, read the poem on page 16. Does this poem support the king or go against him? Number eight, why is Crispus Attucks remembered today? Number nine is true or false. Isaac Barr supported the colonists. Number 10, in what year did the British government repeal the Stamp Act? So just look for the year that they finally repealed the Stamp Act. And for the rest of these 11 and 12, we're going to talk about the word boycott. So boycott means to protest something by refusing to participate or buy. So here's an example. Some people marched outside the supermarket to boycott the high price of lettuce. So I want you to give me an example. What is something that you might boycott as a form of protest? And then tell me what part of speech is boycott. All right, skills. We're going to be reviewing commas today. So we did this a while back, but review your commas using this chart. Um, we use commas for short pauses. So after those transition words, first comma, second comma, then comma. We use commas for lists. So in between each object, there should be a comma. I have pencils, comma, pens, comma, and paper. We use a comma for the date. So after the number of the day, in between the day and the year, you should have a comma. And then also for cities and states. So Denver is the city, Colorado is the state. They're separated by a comma. So using that chart we just went over, you're going to rewrite the sentences correctly. And I'm going to show you a little trick for this to make it a little bit faster. If you highlight the whole sentence, and then using two fingers, if you click on your Chromebook pad, so two fingers, click it, and then you're going to come up and press copy. Then you're going to go to type in your answer, double click again, and press paste. Now your sentence is right there. All you have to do is click where you need a comma and insert it. Okay, so again, you highlight, you double click with two fingers click, copy, two fingers click, and paste. So just a little trick to make it go a little bit faster. So numbers one, two, and three, you're going to do copy and paste the sentence and insert the commas. For number four, I want you to write a sentence that includes a series of three things you will do after school. So that's like this example right here. So tell me three things you're going to do after school and put those commas in the correct spots. 
All right. We've got some words here we're going to talk about with the um, root word port. So we've got import, export, transportation, portable, portfolio, and support. All of the meanings are here, and I also gave you an example of a sentence using that word. So you are going to fill in the blank for each of these sentences and choose the correct word. So the United States blank many goods to be sold in other countries. Jordan has a blank radio to listen to when the power goes out. We had a moving truck blank our things to our new apartment. When I make a final draft of my paper, I will add it to my writing blank. So again, use that chart, fill in the blank with the correct word. And the last part of your skills today is about cause and effect. So we've talked about this a lot throughout elementary school. A cause is why something happens. The effect is what happens because of that. So for this example here, Thomas did not feel well this morning. So because of that, he did not go to school. The cause is he's not feeling well. The effect is he did not go to school. Okay, so for the rest of the problems, you're going to read the sentence and you're going to choose the correct one. So for the first one, Joshua put on his heavy winter coat because it was cold outside. So choose which is the cause, which is the why. Number 10, I got burnt by the sun. What could be the cause of this? Why would I have been burnt by the sun? Give me a reason. Number 11, my alarm clock did not ring this morning. What could be an effect of this? So if my alarm clock did not ring, what could happen because of that? Number 12, a balloon popped. What could be an effect of this? 13, I skipped lunch. Give me an effect of that. And 14, I, the cake burned. What could be a cause of this? So why might the cake have burned? All right. Make sure to use the text, use these anchor charts I gave you, and get on Zoom if you need any help. Have a wonderful day, and I will see you all next time. Goodbye, Adams.